Yeah, so I'm uh, Mike Mazur from Cornell University, and I'm going to tell you about our efforts with winter squash. So the goal and noted for winter squash improvement is to make a very high quality winter squash uh, that has a, has a robust and organic system and has excellent storage. But the reason that this doesn't exist already uh, is you know, given the challenges of growing out to curb its and organic systems. So uh, to reduce some of them that I'm sure a lot of you are quite familiar with, uh, early in the season, uh, cucumber beetles uh, will uh, cause uh, lots of defoliation of plants, start to vector pathogens that cause uh, bacterial wilt and other uh, viruses like squash mosaic virus that can even be seaborne. And later in the season, as the fruits start to develop, uh, there's differentials we can uh, select for in the field. Uh, from my right, uh, we can find some squash that have virtually no cucumber beetle damage, uh, progressing all the way to the fruit on the left that have a lot of cucumber beetle damage. So you can see the, the feeding on the right and is not, that's uh, important for the squash's ability to store. So as they're feeding, uh, some of the sugars are leaking out of the squash onto uh, the outer rind where it's a really good environment for uh, mold to develop and then they can penetrate into the squash. Um, in addition to the beetles, there's also all the foliar diseases. Um, so uh, there's on the bottom right uh, powdery mildew and a host of other uh, foliar diseases in the field that the, the photo on the top. Uh, you can see that you know, as you get defoliation of uh, different plants, the foliage is very important uh, to squash quality. It's where all the photosynthesis happens to be able to conduct all of the sugars. It's important for a very high quality squash. And uh, also for storage squash. Uh, and uh, it would even not be uh, appropriate to jack o' lantern pumpkins. The vine is also becomes the stem as you get to the squash. So having a very healthy vine uh, is limiting how much uh, decay gets transmitted into the fruit. And also in the, the bottom left is a picture of another foliar pathogen. It's the same one that causes black rot of the fruit, uh, which can uh, be uh, start to accumulate on the foliage in the field. It's detrimental to uh, the foliage and the health. And it also uh, produces a inoculum load in the soil that will later affect the fruit. And so what it looks like on the fruit. Uh, so on the left is uh, the petrified wood look of the, the pathogen uh, black rot in its early stages in the field. So you see this petrified wood appearance and those, those are normally culled in the field. Uh, but later in storage you end up with this insidious progression that will be happening while the squash are in storage. So you can see it's starting out as just a softening of the rind and wet discoloration that will then as the fungus starts to sporulate turn black. And so that's the, the black rot. So with those challenges, we know those are the things we're going to have to select uh, against in the breeding program. And so we started to screen for parents. So what are our starting materials? Where can we go to find uh, traits that can uh, be uh, good to include in the breeding program? So thinking about squash storage, we went through a number of heirlooms that were described as being uh, squash that had really good storage. Uh, so some of them, like in the center, a Long Island cheese is quite well known for having uh, good storage. Others that emerged from the initial trials. Uh, on the left is Chirimin, on the right is a Putsu Blast, and on the bottom is Upper Ground Sweet Potato. And these are just squashes that were storing quite well uh, in our trials. And then two other parents that we wanted to add in uh, to the breeding program were to contribute other traits that we already knew that these were going to be our sources. So on the, the top right is a squash bugle. It's developed by Ed Cornell a number of years ago, and it's essentially the gold standard for powdery mildew resistance in squash. And so we wanted to combine that with a really high quality squash, and we had a recent release on the, the top left, uh, Honey Nut. And so Honey Nut is an exceptional quality squash. Uh, high mowing uh, describes in their catalog as their squash with the most pizzazz. And uh, we're very flattered that uh, Chef Barber the Blue Hill for Stone Barns features it as one of the courses in his dinner video. Uh, and it has really high quality because it has a, a very difficult process made between butternut and buttercup. So it has a lot of the really high sugars and fine grain quality uh, from buttercup introduced into it. And if you cross the two at the bottom, you can see the F1. 
uh, which uh, initially struck us as a rather high quality squash uh, already. And so we also got some work with that. And so uh, here you can see a little bit of detail about that first, looking at that first initial hybrid. Uh, so uh, there's honey nut at the top, and you can see it both uh, the outside of the fruit and cut open. So it's a very dark orange, uh, and a fine grain, uh, quite sweet. Uh, we have them in the field that are in, in excess of uh, bricks of 15, which is quite high and sweet for a squash. Um, and but it doesn't have a, a bit of a blocky shape. Uh, and when it's immature, one of the distinctive features of it is that it has a green rind. Um, so causing that to bugle, um, which has uh, more of a, it can have a little bit more of a dog bone shape and not quite uh, as highly colored or sweet. You, you can see in comparison to the middle, the F1 is more uniform, has a nice standard butternut shape, and it has basically the best of both worlds pretty much combined. Uh, it has a, you know, quite a bit of the color and intermediate bricks, and while honey nut, uh, is not really susceptible as much to black rot in the field. Uh, it does tend to desiccate and dry out a little bit in storage, whereas bugle doesn't. And so the F1 uh, has a much better storage uh, and kind of tends to combine the best of both worlds with the squash. Um, and so one of the um, objectives we had uh, was to see if you know, we could uh, re be able to release this uh, as a standalone altar and also try to further improve it. And so we have uh, all of these uh, parents crossed together in addition to all the other Squatch Emerges Good Storage checks. So uh, we plant these out in the field, usually from each cross. We sell the F1s and create F2 populations. Uh, typically 50 to 100 plants in each F2 population. We have several populations. And at this stage, it's going through the field and looking for uh, the easiest to select for traits at this point. So we're going to be powdery mildew resistance and non cucumber beetle preference. Uh, we can do some early, you know, reasonable earliness, reasonable yield, but those, those are all things we can select later. And then every uh, one fruit on every plant is self-pollinated. And from that, uh, we'll uh, get the seed for the next generation and also go through um, and uh, look at those uh, squash or sweetness of the bricks. So then after that initial F2 selection, we went through and we found all the, the squash that were our favorites and started to do some preliminary trials and those will continue to advance. And uh, one of the ones that continues to stand out uh, is uh, that F1 squash, the first cross we had between uh, bugle and honey nut. So it's been an exceptional squash in our trials. Uh, we're releasing it uh, this spring. Uh, so it will be uh, called Amber Delight. Uh, we got the name registered. Um, and so far, uh, uh, there's been uh, some growers that are interested in trialing it, and it really solves what at least one grower specifically voiced is, is that we want a honey nut squash, but could you make it a little larger, and could you make it store longer? And this squash is doing that. Um, uh, for Chef Barber's purposes, uh, a little larger uh, is, you know, as an entree, uh, as a, one of the courses, uh, the smaller is better. Uh, well, the storage is good, and it, I think for him, we still want to try to boost the bricks even further. So he'd like honey nut, uh, as more honey nut than honey nut. So just to give you an idea of uh, what some of the data are looking at now in the trial. So on the, the top left, you see the percent black rot infection. So the, the number of squash that have petrified uh, wood uh, appearance. So Bugle had about 30% of the squash in our field, which do tend to have uh, be prone to the black rot pressure. And Amber Delight and Honey Nut, you can see, are much lower, less than 5%. The marketable fruit per plant, Honey Nut, is a small fruit. Amber Delight is also on the smaller side, but we're getting uh, about five fruit, fruit per plant, where Waltham and Bugle, uh, uh, three or less. In terms of the marketable weight, uh, you can see um, that Waltham is having about four and a half kilograms, and Honey Nut and Bugle are a little bit less, um, at two and a half, and her delight is still pretty high at four. And so then, so that's the marketable weight. So if we look at the total on uh, the fruit number per plant, uh, you can see that Amber Delight and Honey Nut uh, for the total fruit, we're having almost 10 fruit per plant, 
or in the zone of five or six remarkable. This is because it's a rather late season squash, um, and a lot of those are immature at that stage. And so now what we know uh, is if we can do some other crosses to be able to increase the earliness of those, we can have a really high yield. And as we were crossing back to honey nut and some to increase quality and some of the earlier squash, uh, we have not only just uh, an early success here, but a pretty clear path to how we can 